So, if we're going to talk about probiotics, let's just understand what they are. And there is a definition for them, and that definition is there. The important, well, I'll read it out, live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. That's the definition of a probiotic. Now, there are three parts to that. And if you don't remember the words as they are, that's fine. And you don't have to, and most people don't. But what you do have to remember is a probiotic must have live microorganisms. Otherwise, it just doesn't cut the mustard as a probiotic. It's got to be delivered in adequate amounts. Now, that's a subjective measure. It's, you know, it can be whatever it is. But that is very closely linked to conferring a health benefit on the host. So if it's not delivered in an adequate amount, it won't confer that health benefit. So there are three parts to that test of what is a probiotic. Live microorganisms, adequate amounts, doesn't matter what the amount is, as long as it's adequate to deliver that health benefit. So now we start to talk about our product, which is called Milo. It is a probiotic, and I'm going to go through why I can say that. It's a feed supplement. It's based on three strains of lactobacillus bacteria, only three. And it is, from our work, a product that, that improves productivity in dairy cattle. It definitely is a probiotic, and as I said, I'm going to take you on a little tour through that. And in other parts of the world, particularly the United States, it probably will be held up as a direct-fed microbial product as opposed to a probiotic. So if you see the word direct-fed microbial, you can generally speak, 99.9% .9 of the time, you can say that's a probiotic if it meets the test that we've just been through. Our discovery work for this particular product came from a small library of microbes that we've got. It's not big. Um, other companies have much bigger ones, but ours were selected because we found that they were in places where there were benefits from these things being around in the soil, in the animal, wherever we found them. We focused on a few, and then we started to look at what made them tick, what's inside them. So we did what we we looked at genetics in them. So we did we sequenced the genomes, which is the genomics. And then we did some bioinformatics work, which is really looking at how they live, getting information from the biology of these bacteria. And that gives you a really strong understanding of the properties that the bacteria possess. It gives you a really strong understanding of the characteristics of these bacteria. It doesn't tell you everything, but it gives you a very strong understanding of what they do and what they potentially can do. Once you've done that, then you have to start to do the bigger, more extensive and more expensive studies where you're looking at the whole animal to prove that those properties that those bacteria possess actually do something that's meaningful. Like we can see lots of thing, things in the lab. Does that convert into something in the animal? Does it actually make the cow produce more milk? Does it help the calf grow faster? You don't know until you do those studies. However, as I said, we find out a lot about those, those microbes if we do the genomics and the bioinformatics. And to be considered a probiotic, not only do you have to have that definition, that, you know, pass the test that the definition puts in front of you, but you're looking for microbes that have these sorts of properties. So you're looking for antimicrobial activities. People think if it's got antimicrobial properties, then it can produce substances, antimicrobials, that can get rid of pathogens. Now that's certainly true. If you look at probiotics, and a lot of them have microbes that can produce antimicrobial substances. You look at things that can, and we're talking about a gut probiotic here, not a skin probiotic, so a gut probiotic. You look at things that can withstand the conditions in the gut. And those conditions in the gut can be pretty hard to tolerate. Very low pH, you've got bile salts. You've got other microbes in there competing for the space or for the, you know, the food sources that are in there. Can they withstand those conditions in the gut? So these are the things we're looking for. As I said, those properties to 
think, make you think this could be a good probiotic? Can they adhere to the lining of the gut? And that's important because that helps them become resident in the gut, at least for a period of time. Maybe not colonising, but at least they're there for a period of time so that they can do the things that you want them to do. Can they aid in the digestive process? Do they produce enzymes that help break down fibrous material? For instance, these are things we're looking for. Can they modulate the immune system? Really important in a calf that's developing an immune system. Really important if it modulates the immune system to be more vigorous in fighting off a disease. So let's look at the first thing, antimicrobial activity. We said that's an important property. And here's some of the lab work that I've talked about. So we're starting on the journey with some lab work. And these, this is two of the strains that we have in Milo. We give them a code, 23 and 26, these two are. Happens to be Lactobacillus casei and Lactobacillus buckmai. And you've got two pathogens. Staph aureus and E. coli. Well, E. coli, you can have beneficial E. coli and you can have nasty E. coli. Anyway, two pathogens. And this particular panel here, the one on the right hand side, that's the best one to look at, I, I think. Because what you've got here is a, a plate, a petri dish, which everyone probably knows about. It's got a dividing wall between this half and that half. And on this, in this quadrant, you've got C for control. Here you've got two quadrants that have been inoculated with E. coli and here you've got 26. Remember 26 is one of those strains in, in my life. So the control has no inoculation and you've got E. coli growing here. And it grows in this particular quadrant because that's where it's been inoculated. So there's no growth there because it's not been inoculated. It's been inoculated here and there is growth. Remember I said there's a dividing wall. Here we've got 26, and this has been inoculated with E. coli too. And you'd think that it should look like this, but there's no growth here because 26 is inhibiting the growth. So it's got antimicrobial properties. 26 is antimicrobial. And we've got the same thing happening here. Not quite the same test, it's just done in two halves. And you've got no growth here. This is 23 as it turns out, and no growth. So here, this is kind of proof that establishes that there's antimicrobial properties. A little bit more of the same. This is the third strain in my life, and the same thing is occurring. On this occasion, we've got E. coli and Streptorubrus. Both happen to be important in the mastitis world, as you know, and we've got the same effect. So all three of the strains in Milo possess antimicrobial properties against pathogens of interest, which is kind of important from our point of view. I'd say tick, first test passed, properties, antimicrobial properties. So we talked about adherence, that's really important if you can, if a bacteria can adhere to the lining of the gut, it's a probiotic of bacteria, it's got the capacity to then do something. It can do something in the epithelial cells, the cells that line the gut, or it can do things by just adhering there and staying in the gut. Because if it doesn't adhere, it will get flushed out quite quickly. And if it gets flushed out, it can only do what it does whilst it's in there before it comes out the other end. Here we've got some epithelial cells. This is just 30 minutes of incubation, so the cells have been put in onto a growth medium. 30 minutes later is that panel. One hour later is that panel, three hours later is that panel, and 22 hours later is that panel. Now these are growing in a comfortable environment, in an incubator in our laboratories, and you see that they look pretty healthy there, they still look very healthy there. They're starting to take the morphology of a, of a typical, of this type of epithelial cell. They're starting to get a little bit closer together, a few more of them, and here after 22 hours they're really forming a sheet of epithelium which is nice, they're good and healthy. It's, and I didn't do this work because some other people that work with me did that, and they're very good at it. So what happens if we start to put one of our strains on there? So this one happens to be 23, 
And these little spindly things that are a bit dark as you can see them here, they are clumps of 23, one of our strains in mine. So they begin to sort of clump up a bit after a very short period of time, and they clump up where the epithelial cells are. If you leave it a little bit longer, one hour, they start to clump on top of the epithelium, on top of the epithelial cells. If you leave it for three hours, you can start to see, I think, that they're really, really starting to aggregate over the cells. There's not so much in the spaces. And after 22 hours, where you've got a nice sheet of cells, there's piles and piles of them all sitting on top of the epithelial cells, and not many in the spaces. So there's a really good... And if you, if you go ahead, as, as um, Kylie and Taylor did, who did this work, if they flush a fluid over the top as they're growing, they don't wash away. So, tip, we've got these bacteria to adhere to the cells. So, Mark, how long will those bacteria actually last for in that state? Or are they there? Oh, they'll last as long as there's a, an energy source. That's a really comfortable environment for bacteria to grow in and for those epithelial cells. They will last there. If in the incubator at that temperature with the cells there and the growth medium, weeks. They'll, they'll multiply and they'll die. So when it, those ones may not be there weeks later, but they're, 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 the generations down the track will still be there. As long as there's an energy source, they're fine. In those conditions, yeah, easy, easy for them. They'd love it. Can I, can I jump in? That's a really interesting question, Roger, that we're now researching now, Yeah. We want them to be as long as possible, yeah. so that then we can go back to the farmers in the future and say, well, you need to dose this often with this much milo, and the nils, and how often is that? One of the, the key questions around the world. So it's been writing on one of the key questions. Mm -hmm. that is. Yeah, it, is, it is a really good question. And, and I don't need to tell you, a healthy cow, when she's eating and drinking, you know, she's flushing her gut pretty frequently. Nothing's there for much, you know, three hours, four hours, maybe. maybe. So, tick, we've got two tests. We've got antimicrobial properties, we've got adherence. So we're going pretty well at the moment. And, and the clearly, clearly we were doing these things deliberately because we wanted to find that these properties existed. So, aiding in digestion. Um, you remember I mentioned that we looked at the genes, the genetics, by doing the genome sequencing. So the genome sequences that we get, that tells us the genes that are on the DNA, this is the, the code for the production of proteins. That's what genes do in a simple setting. And we found that our strains, they had the genes to produce a whole range of enzymes. And just as an aside, for those of you who haven't done much science, if you see ASE on the end of a word when you're looking at things like this, it says that's an enzyme. So anything with ASE, protease, peptidase, lipase, they are enzymes. So a protease is an enzyme that splits up protein, peptidase is a protein, peptides, lipase is a protein. That's <coughs> essentially amylase is starch, polysaccharides, degrading enzymes, sugars and that sort of thing. All of these enzymes aid in digestion. So tick, we're helping digestive processes by producing enzymes. Can they withstand the conditions in the gut? Now, automatically, if you, if you were a bacteriologist, a microbiologist, you'd know lactic acid bacteria, lactobacillus, they're lactic acid producing bacteria they will be comfortable with a low pH and acid environment because that's what they do, they produce acids. But we've done the extra step and we've put them into an environment with low pH. You probably can't read it, but I can barely read it. Red is pH of 3, green is a pH of 4, blue is just growth medium, neutral, relatively neutral pH. 
And you might say, oh, well, at the beginning they're a bit slower than the ones that were sitting in a comfortable environment, but eventually, over time, 24 hours, so that's three, that's six, that's 24, over a bit of time, they pull up to the ones that were in the, the health, the good, comfortable environment. So they can withstand pH, not surprisingly, but we've shown that they can. So, and we knew that. We knew that that would be true because we knew that our bacteria, we could find them in the faeces of the animal and they were still alive. So they could actually go through the whole animal and we could find them in the faeces still alive. So we knew that they could withstand it because we are very keen on the science, we wanted to prove that. So tick, we can do that. Or they can do that. So it looks like a probiotic. So what do we do next? 